to Hi everyone. We're about to get started. So if you could please find a seat. This is our second to the last session of BubbleCon. I feel like this day flew by. And personally, it's probably one of my favorite BubbleCon sessions. So let's get ready. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome to our first live AMA, Ask Me Anything. Well, really, ask our bubble founders anything. So that's probably ABFA. Um, I'm JV, Bubbles Director of Community, and today we're so excited to have you all get a chance to ask Josh and Emmanuel any questions that you might want to hear from them or any, any questions that you need answers to. So please start dropping them in the hop in chat using the Q&A feature. Um, so please go ahead and do that so we can funnel it all in and I can read all your questions. Um, and so while you're doing that, I'm going to ask them a couple of questions. Um, I think starting with, this is our first ever user conference, right, BubbleCon. And so in the last 24 hours, Emmanuel, we'll start with you. What has stood out to you the most? Um, two things. Uh, first of all, as I said this morning, like it's pretty extraordinary to see all these people flying from so far to be with us today. And again, I'm going to be repeating thank you many times tonight, I think, because this is something really special uh, and that definitely stood out. Uh, the second thing is um, the level of expectations that people have uh, to bubble, you know, and that you know, we need to keep delivering, you know, something great to them because a lot of people depend on it. Like uh, pretty much everyone I was talking to talk, was telling me, you know, how much impact bubble has on their life. And that, that's one side to say, it, but the other side is that they depend on bubble for a lot of things in their lives. And we need to make sure that we deliver what, what we owe them. Yeah, I've had the uh, privilege to chat with many of you over the last 24 hours. Um, hopefully, I'll talk to more of you this evening. Um, I even got a chance to briefly hop into the online uh, networking chat for a little bit. And I have to say, just like meeting you all, hearing your stories, and you know, I kind of know some of the prototypical stories that bring someone to Bubble as a founder or developer or, you know, building projects on us, but hearing them over and over, seeing the passion behind them, you know, and really learning about, like, your histories and what brought you here has been just super, super, super cool. That's great. Well, no one asked me that question, but I think my favorite part is meeting all of you and the users here. Um, all right, so we'll dive right into some business questions. Um, there's a perception among some people that no code is lesser than native code. How do you respond to that, Emmanuel? I think it's only a matter of time. Um, it's been 10 years we've been doing this. Uh, for the first you know, five or six years, it was oh, no code, and Bubble in particular, is never going to be as powerful as code to get the behavior that I want for my application. And then after six, seven years, People stop saying that because Bubble become powerful enough when you knew how to combine the different things so that effectively today, there's still some stuff that you, know, you can't do with Bubble, but not too many. Like there are so many things you can do. That's the next thing is that we're hearing is that no code and Bubble in particular is not gonna scale as much as code. And so now it's just about time and proving people wrong. Uh, so, and, and I think we've already done a lot there. There's still a lot of things we can do, and that's definitely one of the big focus for us in the coming uh, coming months, uh, as we discussed this morning. Uh, but we'll eventually get there. Ultimately, our goal is to make that that question is not even relevant anymore. Hmm. Josh, do you have anything to add? Yeah. I definitely agree with what Manuel said. The way I see it, and this is one of the problems with like no code as a term, but it's really just like a spectrum, right? Like working from like low level languages all the way up to, you know, simple high level way of describing things to computers. And I see the real mission of no code as making movement up and down that spectrum totally fluid, right? Like, you know, communicate to computers in the most simplest, straightforward way for the problem you're trying to solve. So it's not really no code versus code. It's you know 
adding to the vocabulary that everyone has for, for working with machines and creating software. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna give it to Brenton now to ask a question. Hey y'all, thanks for taking my question. Um, so I come from a background of software engineering, been writing code for 25 years, and I was not a believer at first in what Bubble would be capable of. Um, but I kept not hitting that ceiling, and now I feel pretty confident that Bubble can do pretty much anything that I want it to do. Um, and uh, so my, my startup, um, a lot of uh, investors ask me, can Bubble scale? And I'm confident now after building in Bubble for two years that it can scale, that you can build applications um, for many, many, you know, large numbers of users, and that's not a problem. But where I have doubts is whether you can scale an app in the sense of having a large team uh, working collaboratively to maintain a complicated code base and uh, build new features. And so my question is, um, do you consider, do you, do you want Bubble to be a tool that um, works for large web apps? And um, have you been talking to people who have that enterprise code experience at big companies with very, very large, sophisticated um, apps to um, kind of see where the current flaws are in Bubble? And are, and are you taking steps to address that? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and ask, answer that. Uh, thank you very much for the question. It's a fantastic one, very much aligned with why we're here and what we're here to do. Um, I'd say our vision here has been very consistent from day one. Like when I'm trying to recruit someone to join the mobile team, I told them we're here to build the future of how software is created, right? Not like software for small applications, not software for MVPs, software period, right? And that means, uh, you know, starting small and scaling both, you know, number of users, size of development team, every dimension, and you know, we've seen, and we've talked about sort of earlier in BubbleCon, how we've had more and more users increase the complexity of their apps. I think there's still a lot more we can do, right? Like there's some very exciting things on our roadmap around modularity, around, you know, like letting you audit like changes made to an application. There's a lot of things we're working on to make it even easier, but um, you know, people have already put their foot down that journey, and we're very committed to, to talking to customers who are trying to operate at the highest levels of software in the most complicated real world situations and, and make it super, super scalable. So I would, I would summarize as like, hell yes, basically. Love that. That's a great answer, hell yes. <laughs> um, I'm gonna hand it to Sarah uh, for the next question. Thank you, JD. Uh, hello. So I'm Sarah. I'm a French bubble developer. And uh, when I discovered the no code, um, I chose bubble to work with because of its uh, community. And uh, I decided to be very active in the bubble community. So I think I'm trying to be. Uh, so my question is what are bubble's plans to continue growing this community of users? All right. Anyone? Yeah. Um, I mean, JV actually should be the one who's running <laughs> these questions. Uh, that's uh, really why we have JV on the team. Uh, but I'll say a few words. Uh, if I had to, I would say two things. Uh, we want to engage more, which is something we haven't done as m we, we were engaging a ton uh, in the early years when it was a very small team, and in particular, it was just Josh and I. And over the time, uh, we've done it a little bit less, so I want us to start engaging more again. And at the same time, empower more local people to do local things. Like uh, one of the things that's very special about our community compared to a lot of other communities is how widespread it is in the world. And the fact that a lot of things that happen in one country are not necessarily relevant to other countries. Uh, and from us being based here, we can't handle all of that ourselves. So the right way I think to grow the community is to enable more people like, like you uh, and many of you here to do more things locally. Um, and so we need to, figure out, you know, building on top of what we already have, because it's not like we don't have a community today. Uh, we need to figure out exactly the right ways to do this, and we have some ideas, uh, but I think there is like tremendous potential in doing so at the local level. And I mean, I, I would say this right here is just supreme evidence for why we want to do it at the end of the day. 
Which is why I think throwing BubbleCon, our first ever user conference, is one of the highest priority and the first initiative when I first joined, um, which I joined four months ago. So this is a great sort of testament that we care about our community. We want to be closer to you as you foster these connections with, with each other. We want you to be part of our growth. And so this is a great way for us to see you all, hear from you in person, and obviously for those of you who are tuning in online as well. All right, so it looks like we're getting some questions from Hopin now. Um, and this one's from Clint. I'd love to know if there are any thoughts on adding HIPAA compliance within Bubble. Emmanuel? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, eventually, yes. I mean, we've added SOC 2 this year, and so as we start, you know, looking, once you do one, you can do more. Um, I can't really share a timeline on this, uh, to be honest, given the other priorities that we have, but it's definitely something that is on our mind. Uh, like, HIPAA is a pretty obvious um, framework that we want to abide by at some point. Uh, I won't give a timeline though on that one, but yes, we have some thoughts on this. Uh, we'll share more when we can. The answer is basically yes to all the certifications. We want to be ISO, we want to be HIPAA. Basically, you know, our, our vision is, you know, we're a platform, right? Like a solid, robust platform checks all the boxes for all the regulatory frameworks across the world. It's a matter of time. And to Manuel's point, like it's not going to be overnight, right? It's a journey and we have to prioritize and pick our battles. But it's, it's a question of when, not if. Thanks, Josh. Um, the next question is from Marius. What are the biggest challenges of letting users select a hosting region on a self-serve plan? Is it technical or UX, UI? Which sounds like a Josh question. Yeah, I can, I can speak to this. So <laughs> this one's kind of close to my heart, actually. Um, do you know how our homepage is built on Bubble? Like everything outside of the editor itself are like, you know, homepage, our account management, all Bubble, right? Um, so right now, that app is very intertwined with our sort of main Bubble uh, cluster. And because we've done that, it makes it hard to have, you know, hundreds of main Bubble clusters because we've kind of special cased it. So on the engineering side, one of the things we've been working on behind the scenes is untangling all of that so that it's not like there's a main cluster, but rather, you know, we have as many shared clusters as we like. As we get to that point technically, then we can start saying, okay, cool, we have a bunch of shared clusters. They can live in, in any region in the world that we would like those shared clusters to, to live in. Um, we still have untangling work to do. I expect that it goes, you know, fa fairly deep into 2024, so I don't want to give uh, a timeline quite yet for when we'll have this, but that's the definitely the technical direction we are uh, working in from a from a UX perspective, it's easy. It's gonna be drop down. Like you know, cool. Pick the pick the region. You know that that will be the uh, the user experience when we get there. Great, thanks, Josh. Um, all right, no code platforms range on a scale from easy to use but less powerful features to harder to use but more powerful and flexible features. Is Bubble happy with their current position on this scale? Emmanuel, we'll start with you. That's a great question, actually, because I've always defined the no-code world as a spectrum and where we are. And we've been very opinionated very early on, in fact, from like the first day, to be on the pretty extreme end of the spectrum, which was, you know, enable more people to do, uh, enable people to do more, not necessarily trying to be the easiest product uh, to use. And so today, I think it's pretty clear we're on one extreme of the spectrum. Are we happy with this? Um, I think this was the right thing to do initially because it was important for us to go against the idea that no-code is not powerful, and the way you show that no-code is not powerful is by being powerful, not necessarily by being the easiest to use. Uh, but I think today there are many things we can do to kind of like correct a little bit and get a little bit easier to use. Some of the things we're discussing this morning with AI in particular is exactly that. Like, uh, AI is not necessarily going to add functionality to the application that's being built, but it's going to be much easier to use it. Uh, and so I, I, I hope that you know, when we uh, meet in, in, in a few years, or hopefully less than that, we get to, into a situation where we're a little bit more centered on that spectrum, but still with a very opinionated idea, uh, view, that, view, point of view that a no-code tool that is actually has the potential to become the standard for creating all kind of software needs to be very powerful. Yeah, and what I'd add to that is I expect the transformation to, that happens over the next one to two years is less us becoming 
easier to use and less powerful, but more keeping our current power and making it cleaner to use, better UX patterns, easier to surface that both for power users and for new users, because I think there's like, frankly, like, you know, a lot of our UX decisions were made by Emmanuel and I back in the day before we had a team of like, you know, world-class UX designers, we did some dumb stuff, right? And we're going to continue to sort of eat out that um, low-hanging fruit, essentially, to get to a place where the power that Bubble has today is exposed in the most, you know, flexible way. And then beyond that point, we can, like, start looking more of, like, a vision-level thing, like, you know, are there easier entry points for users into, into Bubble while getting some of that off the bat with AI? Thank you both. Um, the next question is from Tyson. Uh, when the new mobile native features are rolled out, which was announced earlier, how backwards compatible will it be with pre-existing bubble apps? Will users need to rebuild a lot of pages or logic similar to the responsive rollout? Yeah, I, I was actually having this conversation uh, live a couple hours ago with, so with some of you. Um, the, bad, the bad news and the good news is native mobile is going to be its own editing experience. And we discussed this internally, right? We debated the idea of potentially sort of taking, um, you know, our experience we have today and, you know, having a make it mobile button. But what we decided was designing for truly native App Store mobile has enough differences in how you think about design and think about building an app from, you know, building for, you know, mobile web that we wanted to make it a world-class experience and we felt like trying to achieve strict compatibility would be a step backwards. So what it's gonna look like day one is you have an existing application and you want to add a mobile app to that application. It's almost like a new page in the application or a new screen. The editor is going to be in many ways similar to the editor you're used to, but it's gonna have a few differences. And then you know the mobile app will live side by side with your web application, sharing the same database, sharing the same backend workflows, the same API. Thanks, Josh. Maybe we can um, have another session, maybe another AMA when that rolls out too. Yep, yep. Um, all right, the next question is from Luis. Who is the customer you're building Bubble for? Is it founders and early stage startups building MVPs or is it enterprises? Emmanuel? Another great question, <laughs> uh, and actually pretty deep question. Um, we started 10 years ago really building for founders and early stage startups, and in many ways we're still building mostly for these people now. Like our vision is that you know, when someone starts on Bubble, we're making them the promise that they can build a business and scale on top of, of us, and we, we have to keep growing with them, and it's not something that we, we're willing to change. The good news is that as early stage startups start scaling, they start having requirements that enterprise companies uh, users are getting interested in as well. Like when a startup starts scaling, it looks more and more like an enterprise. And so effectively, even though to be very direct on the response, we are building for founders and scaling startups, like not just early stage startups, because after 10 years, we have a few users that have started scaling, but still startups. Effectively, we are building some things that you know, are getting appealing for enterprise. And so we are exploring what this means for us in terms of um, opportunities. Ultimately, we want Bubble to be everywhere. Like, we want Bubble to be a standard, and so if we are a standard, that means we'll have, of course, founders and early-stage startups and scaling startups, but also enterprise. And so the question is, when do we get there? Since we've done a lot of the work for our scaling startups, which is the primary type of uh, companies we're building for, that can be applied to enterprise. We're exploring to see how uh, this works for them. Thank you. The next question is from JJ, who I think is here. Uh, do you plan on raising more venture capital within the next 12 months? Oh, spicy one. <laughs> um, I'll take a step out of The short response is no. No, yeah. we, we, we're, very <laughs> we're very fortunate to, uh, we have raised significant amount of money at the right time, and so we have significant uh, cash, a good cash position that uh, avoids us to be in a situation where we have to fundraise right now, and so we'd rather focus on building the business and explore these things later on. That said, if anyone wants to lob a massive pile of cash with us with no strings attached in <laughs> extremely generous terms, you know, we're always, always open to, to reconsidering, but, but yeah, we're, we're, we're not planning on proactively seeking it out. Should we put a box as people exit later? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a big box. Very big box. 
<laughs> Remember that big immerse check? Like, you think that, but. Uh... It was mini zeros. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the next question is from Paul. Uh, will Bubble ever support an offline experience? Jeff? Yeah, I can. I can. Uh, <laughs> That's a spicier right, clear, question. Clearly, that this uh, the, this struck a chord. Um, so two two kinds of offline, right? There's offline in the editor, right? And there's offline in run mode when you're running the application, and they're two separate features in my head, like they're com completely uh, separable. Um, so as part of our mobile exploration, um, we are looking into offline for run mode because a good native mobile experience is going to, is going to need that. Um, I don't know if it's gonna be in the initial release, but if it's not in the initial mobile release, it'll be in follow-on releases, and we plan to backport it to, to web applications because we think it's, um, Def definitely needed. Um. <laughs> cool. <laughs> love, mental note, lots of love for offline. Good to know. Um, uh, thank you all. Um, editor, different story. Uh, someday, probably, frankly, like it's, there's just so many cool things we could be working on, and uh, we just don't think it's as transformative. So, you know, like no concrete plans there. Thanks, Josh. Uh, the next question is from Brian. How have your roles as co-CEOs changed since starting Bubble? And how do you think they'll change over the next five years? All right, I guess we should both respond to that question and see if we say the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, they clearly have changed a lot because for the first five years, we were both building the product. So both you know, very hands-on and uh, not managing people. There was not much to, to manage at that point. Um, and then it took us, like, I, I would say maybe a couple of years to really find the right delimitation between, you know, the different teams that we had. Also, when, when we started hiring people, it was a pretty small team. Like, it was first two, and then I think we got to maybe 12 people after uh, 18 months or something. And so it's not like we had as many teams to manage and everything. So it was a little bit fluid, and I would say we've been pretty stabilizing our responsibilities over the last two years. Um, how do I think they'll change over the next five years? We'll see. Honestly, like uh, this is not necessarily something that um, is particularly top of mind. Um, I think what we have right now is working pretty well. There will probably be some evolutions because I think it's important for. Ultimately, what's really important for both of us. Uh, I mean, we've been working together for 11 years. Is really make sure we have the best structure to make sure that you know the company works the best. And so, if there are obvious changes we should be making, we'll make them. That being said, today I think uh, we're in a pretty good place. Yeah, I mean, may maybe what I should answer actually is like. Why be co-CEOs, right? <laughs> um, we, we got that question a lot from investors when we raised our first round. The second round, they're kind of like, okay, you guys clearly are doing something right here. Like, we're not gonna mess with you. Um, but the, the reason to be co-CEOs at all is because we spent you know, a super, super, super long time where it was just the two of us making every single decision together. And we got into a working rhythm where that sort of joint decision making we think is better than the sum of its parts. Like I think, you know, Emmanuel reigns in my worst tendencies, I reign in his worst tendencies, yep. and like we end up with um, just overall better decision making. Um, the, these days, I mean, I'll kind of alluded to this, but you know, just, just to be clear, like I focus on product and engineering Emmanuel focuses on um, operations and go to market, but we both, you know, we're not like off in our own thing. We're sort of paying attention to each other's worlds and working pretty closely together to get to sort of a, a joint vision for where we want to go as a company. And like Emmanuel said, like I think, you know, it's working for us. We're always open to changes, and every time the company reaches a new, you know, scale. Um, level, right, you, all, you always have to be rethinking your org chart, so no promises, but right now uh, we're having a good time. Yep. I have to say personally, just to reinforce that, they do complement each other, so <laughs> I believe that. Aligned. Um, all right, the next question is from Charles. I'm curious about your thoughts between the terms no code and low code. Do you believe either has a more bloated stigma, and do you encourage people to embody one or the other? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so in my mind, I think low-code tends to cater more to developers, mm -hmm. uh, while no-code is more for non-technical people. That's what I've seen, I've seen in the market. Um, and so I think in our case, given the persona we, we're building for, like most of our users 
haven't written code in their life. No code is extreme is, is the right word. Uh, even though you could actually write code in Bubble if you need to, like you know whether it's plugins or like custom HTML, like there are many things. Um, I think low code tends to be a little bit more legacy. Uh, this is these are products that have been existed for probably 20, 20 years. No code is a little bit newer, so they're probably less of a blood stigma to put it as Charles is putting it. Um, I don't necessarily encourage uh, one. I'm very confident in you know saying Bubble is no code. Like we're primarily building for people that do not have a technical expertise. Uh, we're of course welcoming technical people to build on top of the platform, but to me, it's uh, the person we're building for is someone that has not taken CS classes. I, I will say I love the phrase bloated stigma, and I'll be looking for opportunities to use it in the future. But other than that, I have nothing <laughs> to add to Emmanuel's answer. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something about bloated, but no. Um, the next question is from Tanaka. How is the training of Bubbles AI going to be done? Will it be trained on all users' apps? Can users opt in or opt out specific apps? Yeah, yeah, great question. I know this is obviously of concern to the community. Um, we've actually gotten extremely far with prompt engineering in terms of just working with um, teaching, uh, you know, leading language models, bubbles, basically internal language. Um, we are open to training on user applications. Like, you know, we want to make sure we get the best AI product on the market, and we may need to rely on like real world user data. Um, we're committed to do it responsibly, which means that avoiding a situation where you can see something you've built in the output of an AI, which I think is completely unacceptable. Like, back to, I, I think Amanda was actually talking about this a little bit during um, the AI panel, right? Like, if we do train an AI on actual real world applications, whether we train in house or we're using like you know third party you know LLM models, we want to make sure it's like an artist walking through a museum and getting inspired and learning general abstractable techniques, and not someone who's like sitting there like copying. Oh, cool! Like that's exactly how you constructed that page or, or pulled that together. So that's pretty important to us when we think about how we uh, build AI. Thanks, Josh. Um, the next question is from Eric. Are there plans to allow users to self-host their bubble apps? Sounds like a Josh question again. Yeah, I can, I, I, I can speak to that. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> 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 And the, 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 the reason no is a couple fold. Um, kind of gets back to what Alan answered in uh, his AMA earlier today about um, exporting code from Bubble. Like, there is no code, right? Bubble is this sort of complex system of like lots of like infrastructure behind the scenes. It's not like a simple like you know you drop it into like a little container and you put it on like a server. There's like you know multiple services that our engineers are all working on, and you know I think it would be very cool to build a no code tool that was really like drop in. And I think you know there's probably other players in the market working on that, but. Our goal is to build the most powerful platform possible. And when you're building a platform, the requirement that it's easily exportable is just like a huge, like sort of lead weight around your ankle as a as an engineering team. And we'd rather just not make that trade-off. We sort of intended from day one to like focus on making the platform as magical and do as much work for the, the user as possible. So that sort of pulls us away from that direction just from a technical perspective. Got it. Uh, next question is from Peter. Are you looking for ways to get college campuses to start teaching Bubble? Well, first of all, many colleges already are teaching uh, Bubble. The thing, though, is that it's happened only mostly organically. Uh, and I will, so the question is more, are we looking for ways to get proactively, and can we do things to get more co college, uh, colleges to start teaching Bubble? Uh, and yes, I mean, I, I, I would like to find ways. Uh, we've tried a few things. It's, it's actually pretty challenging because there are many different people you can look at colleges um, at, at a given college. But yes, definitely, since the beginning, education is extremely key uh, for us. Um, Bubble, I, often I say that what makes Bubble different from a lot of other tools is that you can actually go wrong with Bubble if you don't know how to use it. Like, you can make bugs, uh, which is why it's powerful. That's the flip side of the coin. And so education is something extremely important because people need to be able to figure out 
what their mistakes are. That's why we have a debugger, for instance. Like, I don't think any other no-code tool has a debugger. And so we definitely want to keep investing in educating people. There's some work we're doing internally with better documentation, like a certification, which is not exactly education, but that's kind of a similar spirit. And uh, the more we can find ways to get more people to teach uh, Bubble, the better. The one thing I would say, though, is that I've seen, and there are some people here, in fact, many of you here are doing this, a lot of education happens outside of colleges. And I've seen like very exciting, uh, like in France, you know, Otto, there are some people doing that in Latin America, where we see people um, teaching Bubble outside of colleges and get, getting to very uh, strong results for their students. So we want to keep promoting that, like we want people to keep doing this. I would love Bubble to be in every college in the world, and we're working toward that, but uh, we need to find the right way to do that. I don't know if you know this, but Emmanuel actually has spent some time in classrooms doing some teaching. He, he, he's been talking about education in Bubble since we started working together uh, 12 years ago. So this is a topic he's been extremely yeah. so, thoughtful on over the years. So this is Josh complaining that I've been repeating that for too many, <laughs> too many years. <laughs> you know, deeply thoughtful and gay. And... Yeah, but yeah, I was teaching uh, full time for a year. Fun fact. Fun fact. Um, all right, the next question is from Paval. When launching a new app, is it hard to predict how the app, oh, it is hard to predict how the app will perform under different loads. Do you plan on releasing some sort of testing feature for load testing? For example, being able to see how my app performs when 100 or 1,000 users using a feature and all the related workflows at the same time. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. So I think this is an awesome feature idea for Bubble. Um, what, what's Alan's phrase? Not a priority at this time. So it's, it's not on our roadmap. I will say this is a great area for the ecosystem. Like, there's no reason this has to be built in-house. So I'm looking forward to seeing one of you develop this service. And then I'm looking forward to see our engineering team ban you guys for like denial of service attacking us. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah no, uh, give us a heads up first <laughs> before you uh, launch that uh, service. But I think the ecosystem could tackle this one. Should we tell them to post it in the forum if they're about to do that? Uh, I think they should actually email, <laughs> email uh, support at bubble.io. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, the next question is from Abraham. For Bubble developer certification, you mentioned certification earlier, so this is a great question. Is there a plan to offer regional pricing for bubblers from developing regions like the continent of Africa? Yeah, so I'll take that one. Um, not immediately. We look, we're going to look into ways. I mean, this is pretty new. We just went into opening certification to everyone a couple of weeks ago now, so uh, it's, it's still fairly new. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about, about this because it, I know it's an important topic given how global our user base here is and explain a little bit our situation. Our situation is that we're a US-based company with US costs, and so we need to find ways as much as I would like to uh, localize prices uh, for our global user base. We need to find ways that actually keep working when all your, your operations are in the United States. So it's going to take a little bit of time for us to do that uh, in general, uh, just to figure out you know, how we can ensure that our cost is compatible with adapting prices with different regions that have a lower purchasing power. Uh, I, I'm sure we'll get there one day. The question is when. For certification specifically, uh, we'll look into it. It depends a little bit on how much demand we're getting of the different places in the world. This is an isolated enough offering. I mean, it's not really an offering, but it's an isolated enough thing that there might be shortcuts we can find here, but I can promise things uh, here. Anything you want to add, Jeff? No. OK. Uh, all right, next question is from Jacob. By the way, this is all coming live, so please keep sending the questions. When will Bubble reach a QA and testing tipping point that ensures there aren't monthly shipments that break things in users' apps? I think I'll uh, take that one. As anyone who follows me in the forum knows, I have uh, opinions and thoughts on the subject. Um, so basically, the way I think about it and the way I think a lot of the software industry thinks about it is it's a... Uh, it's a basically probability and um, statistics thing, right? It's not like anyone ever reaches 100% uptime. There's no such thing as 100% uptime. The question is, like, how frequently do you have downtime? How frequently do you recover from that downtime, right? And, you know, 
when we ship a feature or release that breaks users' applications, it usually affects you know, some percent of our user base, right? And the work we're doing is to decrease that percent over time by covering more and more of the major feature areas with really, really solid, robust testing such that like, you know, instead of breaking 100 applications, we break 10 applications or two applications or one application, right? Because if we're continually driving down the, the impact of bugs and sort of increasing the obscurity, the odds that your application is the one that gets impacted by any kind of issue we have, like goes down over time until eventually, you know, we hope, you know, maybe we break your app once a year. Maybe we break your app once every two years. Maybe we break your app once every five years. I mean, Google, I think, like, you know, has higher levels of downtime than, you know, an issue once every uh, five years. So there is no 100%. There is no magic bullet. I think, um, as Alan was discussing earlier, we'd love to give people opt-in control over when um, new code gets deployed to their applications. That's going to take time to get to. And even that's not a magic bullet because there's still the infrastructure that powers that system. There's, you know, we have issues that, like, we haven't touched bubble, but you know, user behavior patterns change and we have infrastructure problems. So I see it as basically a journey of continual improvement. There's no like magic moment where we can say we're done, we've, we've tested enough, but we can measure and drive down the incidence of uh, problems over time. And that's how, you know, web scale robust platforms manage this and think about reliability. The end of the question? Sorry, team, can you go back up so I can read the end of that question? Um, the question was, when will Bubble reach a QA and testing tipping point that ensures there aren't monthly shipments that break things in users' as apps? Do you want to uh, add A up? higher priority than working on uh, testing? Yeah, um, the way we think about it, right, like it's not really an either or thing. Like we need to be continually investing in the platform and then continually delivering value to our users with the platform, right? Like, you know, I, I don't think a well run company, you know, pauses and spends years working on reliability. I think a well run company is always pushing reliability forward. Um, so, uh, that, that's kind of our approach. Like we're, you know, always going to dedicate a lot of effort to improving the platform. We have stepped that up and we're taking a lot of time now to invest in that. But we also think that um, the long-term success and health of the platform also comes down to evolving and improving. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for the transparency too. Um, the next question is from Brenton. Have you considered a program that allows bubble devs to invest in bubble? I'll take that one. Um, short response is uh, yes, but too late, I think. So initially, yes, we, we thought about it uh, when we did our funding run in 2021. And the truth is, legally speaking, this was complicated to do. We had actually quite a few conversations with our lawyers back then to do that. Um, and it just turned out it was too complicated to do. Um, I want, I'm sure we'll find ways to you know, make sure that you know the early community gets uh, is part of the bubble story, even from an investment perspective. But pr maybe not in like the company itself. There might be other ways to do that. We, we'll we'll explore what we can when we can. Uh, today's is is pretty complicated to do. Hmm. All right. Next question is from I think this is Gio, who I think is also here in the audience today. Um, we, <laughs> Will you release a database update soon that makes the need of third-party database and backend integrations obsolete? What does that roadmap and timeline look like? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take that one. Um, so I think there's always going to be a place for integrations, right? Like at the very least to connect to like existing systems that weren't built in bubble originally. So we, we don't have any plans to move towards a world where, um, you know, 
other databases don't talk to Bubble. What I will say is I think today, sometimes people choose third-party databases for reasons that we aren't proud of, right? Like for reasons that we would love to see change. And I think a lot of the things we talked about over uh, BubbleCon, you know, in terms of, um, you know, our bulk data operation work, um, you know, working on performance, working on scale, um, you know, address some of the uh, feature gaps. Um, I don't think there's like an all-in-one, like we make one release and all of a sudden like no one um, uses third-party databases with Bubble, but I think we're gonna chip away at all of the, the various reasons why someone might, for for bad reasons, not for good reasons, choose a, a different tool than our in-house database. Um, we see 2024 as a big year for investing in our databases, and I'd say by the end of the year, um, you know, it's not good. like products always evolve, right? It's not going to be a perfect product, but I expect us to be a very different place in terms of you know our database product and like you know how, how it stands in the industry. Sounds like we're going to have a big and busy 2024. Absolutely. Uh, all right, next question is from Reynaldo. Do you think that AWS will acquire Bubble sometime in the future? <laughs> Sorry, we are reading this live, so. Uh, what, do you think, what do you think about this M&A subject? All right, uh, I'll take a step at that one. Uh, so first of all, I don't have a crystal ball, so it's hard for me to tell what AWS will do in the future. Uh, more seriously, to, responding to the second question, which is really the M&A subject, uh, it's not, it's currently not at all on our mind, you know, on our mind, you know. Um, most examples of acquisition in history usually don't lead to great success for the product themselves and the users. You have a few examples where it's different, but usually when a company acquire, uh, acquires a company like, like Bubble with a product, you become one product in the product suite of what the company is doing, and at some point people stop using that product because a acquiring company is not investing too much. And so it's not at all what's on our mind right now. Right now we think we have an opportunity to create something great, something massive, something that becomes a standard for software development. And I don't believe that this is something that happens through uh, m and in the, in the middle term. Uh, that being said, you know, again. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, and, and, and it's not how we've been running the company at all. And, if you look at our fundraising history, it's the same. Like we've never done things thinking, okay, there is an opportunity to get like to an acquisition in the short term. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we can break that question down to two parts, right? Would AWS want to acquire us, and would we want to be acquired, right? Um, and I can't speak to that first question. I mean, obviously, like I think we're a pretty attractive acquisition target. <laughs> Second question. To Mandel's point, right, we would only consider an acquisition if we thought it was like the best path forward for the community, and we think that it is unlikely an acquisition will be the best path forward for the community. We're in this to win this. Like, we want to build a world-class global platform. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Klaas. As the market has grown with a lot of competitors, some other tools have cool solutions that Bubble could learn from or copy. Have you seen any examples of this that you want to act on? <laughs> Who wants to start? Uh, I, I'll go quickly. Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, uh, I hope we don't copy. Like, it's really not what we're doing here. Learn from is different. Um, so I, I'll respond tactically about what we can learn from others and then how I think about competition in general. Um, what we can learn from others, I, I think some of the newer players have created onboarding experiences that are really exciting uh, and very slick and something that the truth is we haven't given as much love as we could have over the years. I mean, for people who have been on Bubble for a long time, uh, the teaching lessons that we have at the beginning were built in 2013, you know, so it's not 10 years old. It still work, you know, and people still go through them, uh, but this is, you know, this is to say that while we did spend quite some efforts 10 years ago on onboarding, it's not something that we have done for a while. It has changed over the last uh, few months, but it's pretty new. And so I think that's where there is a lot of opp opportunities for, uh, for us to learn. Um, in terms of competition as a theme, uh, this is not something that's really top of mind for us. I think you know, we're in a space that is just growing. Our, um, if you look at the no-code market as just being a market, then of course we're competing with each other, but it's not how we see it. We see the market as a software development market, and that market is massive, it's growing. 
No code init is a very small percentage of this. And so what's really important for us is just to get better at what we do, not copy or try to fight each other because I don't think that leads to anything good, and just make sure that we increase the adoption of no code tools to capture more of the entire no uh, software development market. Um, and so that's why we keep repeating the team. Like we don't really look at other tools being like, oh, look, they did this, let's copy that. It's not. There's definitely great learning opportunities looking at what other people are doing and some new teams are coming with great things, but it's not the first thing on our mind when we wake up. Yeah, str str strongly agree with that. The only thing I'd add is um, we try and take a humble development approach, right? Like we think we've made a bunch of good product decisions, but we also think we've made a bunch of not great product decisions. I think that's true for, for any product. And we're always asking ourselves like, how can we do better? And often like, you know, internally, like our own engineering team, our own design team, our own product team, our own marketing team, our own, you know, customer success team who, you know, hears from you every day can point to ways we could up our game. So we almost don't really need the example of competing products. That said, right, like, you know, we learn from everything, right? Like we, we do look at, you know, competitive products. We do look at the feedback we get from the community and we try and, you know, be constantly self-critical of like, how can we make Bubble better? Because, you know, like, that's how you build a really good product. You're always evolving. You're always saying, like, you know, what can we level up next? Giving the people what they want. Yeah. Uh, all right, the next question is from Kelly. How do you weigh in the tiny UX paper cuts we all grumble about as developers, and which feels like low-hanging fruit versus large upgrades? Do you have plans to prioritize the former? Pretty please. <laughs> with, with, with sugar on top. Um, <laughs> is, yeah, so, so Alan touched on this a little bit. Um, we, we do pay attention to them. We do like fixing them. Um, we plan to bundle them in with sort of some of the larger scale editor, um, you know, improvements in UX cleanup that we want to be doing over the next year. Um, and the reason we want to do it that way, like sometimes we target a specific paper cut, but often even a small change is connected to like a lot of other code. And it's sometimes actually easier to um, level up like an entire user interface than it is to make a change sort of in situ. So we're, we're sort of weighing the two, right? Like if there's like a nice, clean, simple boom, we can like just fix this, get out there. And it's like a net win. We, we take those shots when we can. Um, but, but often it's about like, rather than like fixing five of them, how about we just like make that UX you know, to the next level, and maybe some of them won't even be relevant after we make some of those changes. So that's kind of how we think about it strategically. Thanks. So one thing I'll add is that keep them coming, though, because yeah, yeah. it's important yeah. for us to know, like, Kelly, please keep tweeting. I see your tweets a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because this is, and actually, this is something important to mention. Like, sometimes people say, you know, we share things, but people, the team doesn't react on it. The truth is, most of the things that you guys share uh, online or through email or through the forum, uh, we see them and they get somewhere. The question is how fast do we go on them? And Josh explained just you know, how we think about trade-offs here. But we definitely look at these and they get somewhere. And then at some point we get, uh, we get to them. Thanks for the question, Kelly. Next up from Alexander. Which companies or products does Bubble see as its biggest competitors? What business and growth goals does Bubble have in the coming years? All right, uh, since I started talking about competition, I guess uh, it's kind of a follow-up. Um, so as I was saying, like, even though there are other no-code players, I think uh, we all have a pretty different value proposition. And we're in the market that is tiny, like the no-code market compared to the overall software development uh, space. That I think it doesn't, I don't see any one of them as actually a competitor. The real competition that we're dealing with is code, is, you know, uh, traditional software development shops, traditional software engineering that are saying, don't use no code, don't use bubble, use code to build things. That's really the thing we want to compete. And that one, we're going pretty aggressively against them, actually. Uh, it's not one company, it's really one type, uh, one way to build things. Uh, and so that's by far is the biggest competitor. Our mission is to prove that, you know, you shouldn't be using code because it's expensive and slow to build and bubble is faster and cheaper to build them. And you get to like feature or scalability parity. Um, to the second question around business and growth goals, um, I mean, I, I won't get too specific about numbers, but I mean, our, we, we want to grow faster than the software development market because if we grow software faster than this market, that means, you know, Bubbles adoption is growing faster and that means 
eventually we'll get to a world where a big chunk of the market of the software being built in the world is built on bubble. Um, yeah, and so it, it's very hard because this market is actually growing very quickly. Uh, as we were, I think I said that in the AI panel, like p software penetration is still really low. In, so if you look in the entire world about the number of people that could be using custom software that are not. Uh, and so this is a space that is expanding very quickly. And so we want to make sure we grow faster than that. Yeah. I agree with that. The next question is from Connor. What are Bubble's plans to increase plugin development support? I can jump in uh, with that one. Um, the honest answer is it's TBD a little bit. Um, there's a lot of work we'd love to do in the uh, plugin editor itself. Um, you know, I think there's ways we can make that a much easier experience to, to use. Um, it's sort of on the bubble whether you know, <laughs> uh, whether or not we get to it in um, 2024. Like you've heard us talk a lot about our 2024 objectives. There's a lot of ambitious stuff we're doing, and we want to make sure we can execute on that. And we have to make priorities and choices, right? So we might be able to do some tactical investment there. We might not. Um, what we're definitely going to do though is invest in you know the general support for our ecosystem. You know, outside the plugin editor, helping like plugin discovery, helping people. You know, get to the like most effective plugins. Um, you know, right now um, we we our plugin uh, display algorithm just you know sorts by like you know number of installs, which tends to favor like plugins that have been around forever, even if they're not like kept up to date in the same way that newer plugins are. And I think there's a lot of improvements we can we can and will make in that space. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I just want to do a quick time check here. We have less than. 10 minutes, so please continue to submit your questions. Uh, the next one is actually about our certification, our developer certification. So are there, this is from Drake. Are there plans to expand Bubble's developer certification offerings to introduce specialized certifications like security or data architecture? Who wants to take this one? I'll, I'll take that one. Yep. Potentially, uh, honestly, it's too early to tell. Like, we just launched this uh, to everyone, so we want to see, you know, how this is working, how much people are adopting it, the type of questions that are more useful, less useful. Uh, but I don't see why we wouldn't have that at some point. The question is when, when, I'm not sure if security or data architecture is the right thing. Maybe it would be mobile once we have a mobile offering. Uh, but what's certain is that the health of the ecosystem depends on people being able to know who is good and, sorry to be blunt, but people that are not good at bubble. Uh, because Ultimately, if people are not very good at bubble, then it leads to a bad experience to everyone. And so we think it's our role as bubble to help people identify what's good and not good in the market. Then the question is, what are the different things we should be testing on? We'll figure this out over time. But it's certification and overall trustworthiness of the ecosystem is definitely something we're going to keep investing more and more on. Sounds good. Next question is from Nate. Are there any plans to eliminate the refresh page to continue banner that appears to end users? <laughs> <laughs> it, it used to be a dialog box. That was way worse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to end users when bubble updates are made, especially for more basic updates. I'm Josh? shocked by the reaction here. I thought you all loved that banner. <laughs> <laughs> So, so this is like another thing that might be like a positive externality of our work on mobile because that banner doesn't work with mobile super well. Um, again, this is like maybe it'll be part of mobile v1, maybe it'll be a follow-on feature to mobile after launch where we tackle this. Um, you know, as, as we develop the solution for mobile, we definitely backport it to web applications as well. Um, so definitely something we're thinking about, you know, in the context of mobile and then how we'd apply it to the rest of our infrastructure. But um, it's, you know, like not sure exactly where it's gonna land on the mobile roadmap yet. Thanks, Josh. All right, the next question is from Frankie. Scale and allowing apps to grow on Bubble has been mentioned a lot. How do you define scale? Is it revenue, number of users, workload, or something else? What magnitudes do you have in mind when you say a scaled app? 
That's that's a cool question. Um, we, we've actually been sort of discussing this internally as a team, like trying to like you know run analytics on our user base and understand the various dimensions on which you all are growing because things tend to grow together. Like you know, team growth, revenue growth, data growth tends to go hand in hand, but also diverges a fair amount. And like you know, I know some people who have built very successful applications on Bubble with the tiny team, right? Um, so. The way we think about scale is really the progression of all those factors together, not because they always move hand in hand, but because we want to support the cases where they do. And by supporting the cases where they do, we can support the users who are only scaling on you know, one of those dimensions as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a pretty <laughs> eloquent uh, answer to a complicated question. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, I have a question around the training of Bubbles AI. What if I don't want some of my apps to be used for training? Is there an opt-in or opt-out option? Yeah, so that kind of touches to the AI question we were talking about earlier. Like, like, like I said, we're actually getting pretty far without direct training on applications. As we get into more training, um, you know, we're going to figure out exactly how it will work. But sticking by those commitments I, I mentioned earlier in terms of making sure we don't end up in a situation where you're recognizing your work and the output of any AI tool that, that we come up with. Any thoughts, Emmanuel? What that? Do you have any thoughts? Sorry, we're just no, looking no, 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 at the I'm, last question. No, I think that's a great response. All right, I yes, guess. I, I am laughing because yeah. I, I don't know if this is a serious question or not, but there's a funny question on the prompt which we may or may not read out loud. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm going to read it out loud. Might, might as well. I mean, it's, okay. our, it's our final um, question. Well, actually, it's not our final question. How did Josh and Emmanuel get so ridiculously good looking? <laughs> So, uh, I, I, I'm not too sure how to interpret this question. Does that mean we were not good looking before? And something that <laughs> happened it's, over the years, yeah. This is a user I, question, I, so. I mean, how, have the community seen that picture of us from like the early days, like our first uh, drone publication? I, I would say that like that was not a good looking photo, so. <laughs> that's true. And I think there has been some progression over the years. We'll make sure that's part of the recap email that everyone's going to get. Great, great. I don't want to ask this question, though, but um, will there be a BubbleCon next year? <laughs> should we? Uh, so, if you think there should be, please raise your hand. All right. Well, apparently, this was a popular event. Um, yeah. um, the, the, I'm going to be kind with uh, JV and not put her on the spot right now. Um, what I would say that, I mean, I hope so. I, I hope we'll find ways to gather again as a community. We have to really figure out you know, what is the right way for us to do that. And this, I, I, this is not done yet, but I consider this first edition to be a frank success. And I want to give a shout out to JV, who's been pushing that project, because this is not a small, not a small project four months in at the company. Um, we're going to be reflecting you know, after everything is done and see you know, uh, what is reasonable for us to do. But what, what I can say for sure is that we will find more ways for us to gather together as a community. Hopefully, it's BubbleCon. Uh, the timeline is something we'll have to work on. And I also just want to give a shout out to the entire Bubble team, actually, who you've met, support, success, product and engineering, our entire marketing team, um, sales. I think there's so many people that worked extremely hard to get us here today. Thank you. And thank you to all of you who flew from, I think we have two users who flew all the way from Australia to come here. So from all over the world. Um, so thank you all for being here. Oh, we, have, uh, we, we wish we could spotlight you right now. But um, thank you for flying all the way here. Um, it sounds like that's all the time that we have. For any other questions that we didn't get a chance to cover, um, we will pull the most common and top questions, and we'll try to answer them on the blog post BubbleCon. And so thank you to Josh and Emmanuel um, for being so vulnerable and honest with us and doing this AMA. And we'll see you for our final BubbleCon session, where we get to announce our hackathon winners and our closing remarks in just a few minutes. So come back. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.